Good morning, Kingdom Rice Church. This is Pastor Ray, and I am so excited to see your faces, to know that there's people on the other side that are ready to receive a word from God, that have been prepared, that have been pushing through, that have been fighting through, that have been believing and speaking life when challenge has, has confronted them, when adversity has been ever present in their lives, and yet they believe that God has more in store for them. I'm not speaking about another person. I'm not speaking about another people. I'm not speaking about another church. I'm speaking about you. God is about to blow the doors off your life, off of our lives. But before he can do that, we have to be ready. And how are we prepared? How do we get equipped to be able to receive all that God has for us? By spending time with him. How do we spend time with him? By paying, what? Taking time, but slow down, taking time to pray. So let's begin our services as we always do, by preparing the atmosphere of our hearts in our homes in prayer. Holy Spirit, today, Lord, more than ever, we don't need a word, we need a collision. Collision, that was the word that kept coming into my mind as I was worshiping. Is that, Lord, we ask that today you would collide with our thinking collide with our lifestyles, our circumstances. Lord, we ask for a full-on collision. Take us head on, Lord. Inundate us in your goodness. Show, what, show us what it is to truly be grateful. Grow our hearts today, God. Soften our hearts. Give us tender hearts, Lord. Give us ears to hear eyes to see, and mouths to proclaim the goodness of God. Lord, today your kingdom continues to be developed, ever present and real in our lives. So Holy Spirit, we surrender this time to you. Throne room of heaven, let us see you for what you are. King of King, Lord of Lords, Challenge our lives, grow our lives, expand our territories. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You know, as we were worshiping, the Lord just continued to speak to me about so many things. And there was two thoughts that the Lord continued to show me or reveal to me or to repeat or rerun in my mind. The first one is the actual message today, which is going to be the message of hardened hearts, hidden kingdom. That's right, hardened hearts, hidden kingdom. And the other thought that I continued to process and continue to touch my heart was the least of these, the least of these. So I'm, gonna just, I'm just gonna deep seed those two thoughts and we'll revisit them as we go through this journey in the Gospel of Luke. So hardened hearts, hidden kingdom, thought number one. The second thought is the least of these. And so we're going to go ahead and see how these two play together and how they come to fruition and how they collide with our Christianity and they challenge our reality. And we really come to know and understand the sovereignty of God. You, you already know and I already know that we are in the Gospel of Luke. You know, and one thing that you're going to find or that we found together as we journeyed through Luke and we have accompanied Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, through every single verse, every single waking moment of his life, because that's really what the Gospels are. The Gospels are allowing us to sit front seat, to be in the, in the front passenger seat of Christ's life. That's the beauty of the Bible. That's the beauty of the Gospel. That's the beauty of the good news, is the good news is not absent of us, but includes us. It includes you, and it includes me. So Luke 17 is where we find ourselves, and now the Lord continues to show us how the Pharisees were so close to God in their minds and so far away from him in their hearts. So let's take a closer look as the Lord continues to reveal to us his goodness in his heart towards us, even when we don't fully understand him. So we're picking things back up in Luke 17, verse 11. And it begins like this. And now it happened as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And then as he entered a certain village, there he met him, ten men who were lepers, who stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. 
Have mercy on us. So when he saw them, and I'm sure he saw them like this, when he saw them, he said to them, go, show yourselves to the priest. And so it was that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned. And with a loud voice glorified God, fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. So Jesus answered and said, were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? Were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Arise, go your way. Your faith has made you well. 20. Now, when he had asked, now when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, See here or see there. For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. What an amazing portion of scripture. What an amazing, and I'm going to show you just how amazing it is. And we're going to go ahead and we're going to go process this, digest this, chew this up. And we're just going to just really enjoy every little morsel, all the spices that the Holy Spirit has put into this to really get the true meaning, the, the breath, the depth, the flavor of this passage. And as I was going through the New King James, I was also challenged because last week I began to also teach out of the NASB because of a Bible uh, disappearing, which has been found, praise the Lord. And so I was reading the NASB as well as the NKJV, and I also found some unique insights. And so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to reprocess these two, these two different translations at the same time with you, but they're going to give you very unique perspectives as to what's really going on. So let's go ahead and let's begin and let's take a look and we're going to walk back through, but I'm going to take us through a walk back through the NASB, the New American Standard Bible, so that you can kind of see the differences. And so we begin here in 11 and it says, while he was on the way to Jerusalem, we all know that in scripture that Jesus is on the road of destiny, the road of, to Jerusalem is his final road to destiny. It's his final journey to the cross. It is his last pilgrimage to the cross, to eternity, to destiny. And oftentimes you and I today, we're going to find ourselves on that same road. And we don't fully understand it. Jesus did. Jesus did. And as we come to know Jesus, as we come to spend time with Jesus, as we continue to read the word of God, we also realize that we have a purpose. We realize that there's destiny. We realize that we're living more than just for today. We're living for eternity. So let's take a closer look at this Jesus as he continues on his journey. And he's journeying where? It says here in scripture that he was passing between Samaria and Galilee. Now, I don't know if you realize it, but in past scriptures, Jesus would, or Jesus' parents, according to scripture, says that they avoided Samaria in their pilgrimage to Bethlehem. Why? Because Jews did not like to associate with Samaritans, with the Gentiles, with the unclean people, or so the Jews viewed anyone that was non-Jew. So Jesus goes and he passes between Samaria and Galilee. And it says that as he entered a village, that 10 leprous men who stood at a distance met him. So the first thing we know here is that as I'm reading NASB, that really speaks and jumps out to me. As it says, as he entered a village, 10 leprous men. Interesting, right? So what I read in NASB is that what is noted are two different perspectives. Two, 10, I'm sorry, not two. 10 leprous men. But if I go back to 17, but in the New King James, I find the same scripture, but it is different. And how is it different? It says here, 
In verse 12, it says, Then as he entered a certain village, there met him ten men who were lepers. Two, two versions, ver, versions, two versions of, of verse 12. One labels the men by their condition. The other identifies them because of their, their sex, of who they are, of what they are, and not their condition. So it's very interesting that we find that in the, the same scriptures, very different priorities or observations that sometimes as human beings, we will see people or label people because of their condition. Otherwise, we'll see them as a human being. We'll see them for what they are, not what they have. Amen? And so I really believe that God wants to grow our perspective. Some of us, we look at people and we see a challenge. We see uh, work. We see uh, inconvenience. But others of us, we see a person and we take an interest. We see a person and we see a need. We see a person and we ask the Lord if there's a need. Isn't it interesting how the framework of our lives, though it, it appears the same, the interest in our hearts can be drastically different. And that really spoke to me as I was reading through these two different translations or these two different versions of the very same scripture. But let's see how Jesus responds to these lepers. Now, one thing I do want to share with you is that these lepers met Jesus from afar off. And you may ask yourself, well, why would they meet him from afar off? Well, because in Jewish tradition, lepers could not interact with a, a healthy Jew. So it was not, uh, socially it was unacceptable for any person that had a disease to get close to a person that was healthy. And so if a, health, if a unhealthy person got close to a healthy person, they would make that healthy person unclean or ceremonially unclean, which would mean that now the healthy person can no longer go to the temple, had to go through a purification process, had to avoid people for a certain amount of time, had to wash, and ultimately sometimes burn their clothes, all because of the interaction with an unclean person, an interaction with sin, an un, interaction with, 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 with broken humanity. And I love that about Jesus. Jesus was never scared to interact with humanity's mess. Jesus is never embarrassed of your mess. He's never embarrassed of your situation. He's never embarrassed of what, where you're struggling. He actually wants to know more about it. And I love that about Jesus. So these men, because they were very aware of who Jesus was, and, uh, and they were very aware of the culture, right? What was allowed and what was not allowed. From afar off, they asked Jesus to help them, to touch them to change them. They called him master because they knew who he was. They recognized what he carried. And so I just want you to know that, that sometimes we can be like these lepers. Sometimes we are so ashamed. Sometimes we're so lost in sin that we find safety or sanctuary in isolating ourselves. We, we love Jesus, but from a distance. We want God, but not too much of God. We want change, but, we, but until we actually have to, what? change. And I really believe that that is really a type and shadow of these lepers. These lepers really oftentimes are us. Sometimes there's parts of our lives that we're very embarrassed about. There's parts of our past that we don't want to remember. There's parts of our past that are paralyzing us from entering into the new seasons, new relationships, and new opportunities or the new chapters of our lives. All of us today, God wants to touch us and heal us. And so let's continue on and see how these lepers respond to Jesus. And it goes on here and it says here in 13, now when one of them, when he saw that he had been healed, it says here, he turned back glorifying God with a loud voice. So, okay, so we know that there's 10 that ask for healing. Jesus instructs all of them. I already read this to you guys, so I'm not going to read it again. He, he instructs the men. He doesn't say, come closer to me. He doesn't have them go through a purification ceremony, though he does encourage them to go to the priest so that they can uh, anoint them and they can actually uh, recognize them, reinstate them into the community, declare that they're ceremonially clean. So he sends them back to the priest. That's what the priest did. I don't know if you're aware of that, but whenever you had a disease and you were cleansed of the disease, you had to go to the priest. The priest had to anoint you. The priest had to acknowledge you publicly that you were now 
acceptable so that you can now interact with the community, you could be involved with the community once again. Otherwise, you are still an outcast. So Jesus, the whole purpose of Jesus sending these lepers back was for these lepers to be set free, for them to be branded whole, for them to be acknowledged as healed and no longer as lepers. So in this process, these men, I'm not sure what was going on in their minds, to be very honest with you. I'm sure some of them thought, well, I thought he was going to say something about us. I thought he was going to say something to us. I thought he was maybe going to touch us. He was going to do some crazy miracle, some sort, of, some sort of miraculous sign was going to happen, and then we'd be healed. But what does he do? He commands the 10 lepers to go to the priest, and on the way to the priest, they're healed. Can I tell you something that I really believe? that our Christian walk is just that simple. All God wants is your obedience. And the ingredient to obedience is desperation. These lepers were the least of these. They were the least likely to be loved. They were the least accepted in their communities. They were no longer acceptable. They were now rejects. They were truly the walking dead. They were the least of these. And Jesus said, go back to the priest, show them that you're healed and receive your healing. Be welcomed back into your community. Be received by your family. Now fathers can be fathers again. Husbands can now be reunited with their wives. Sons can be reunited with their fathers. These men could be back. They could become part of a family once again. So this moment, I want you to see what Jesus did and how these men responded. What was the key component? desperation. I believe today that you and I, when we get far from God, it's because some part of us has lost our desperation. Some part of us has lost our need, our desperate need of God. But when we're desperate for God, we'll do anything for him to answer. We'll do anything to get his favor. We'll do anything to receive his blessing. And I just believe that today, if we will be like these lepers, and we will come to God hungry, humble, open, surrendered, and, and honest. I really believe that part of our humanity, part of the condition of man is that his heart is hard. And we're going to find as we look at, at the latter portion of this scripture that the hearts of the Pharisees continue to be hard towards man and towards God. What distances you from God today? is what distanced the Pharisees from God 2,000 years ago, their hearts. Why do we choose to harden our hearts towards God today? Verse 16 says this, And he fell on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. And interesting, pay attention to what Jesus says to him. And this is out of the NASB. He says, Then Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten, were not ten cleansed? Were not ten cleansed? And he's scratching his head. I can only imagine that Jesus is literally scratching his head. He's trying to understand why only one of the ten showed back up. But the nine, where are they? Where's the, where's the rest? I don't know how many times in life you find a situation and it's powerful and everybody's gone. There's only one. There's only one person. Only one person gets it. Sometimes nobody understands you, but guess who's the one person that gets you? It's God. God gets you. And right now, God is trying to get and understand the thinking in the heart of these 10 because only one came back grateful. Only one came back glorifying God. And only one came back, and that one was not a Jew, but a Samaritan. And it goes on here, and it's 17, and it says, But the nine, but the nine, where are they? Was no one found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Stand up. This is Jesus speaking to the Samaritan, the foreigner, the least likely, Right? The least of these, the least likely to come back, the least likely to get healed, the least likely to get saved, the least likely to be loved by God, the least likely to be healed by God. 
the least likely to glorify God. And he said to him, stand up and go. Your faith has made you well. I see here two things. That God does the greatest miracles with the least likely. God does the greatest work with the most broken people. It's not the qualified people that are loved by God. It's the people that think they're disqualified and don't think they're deserving of God's love. I love that. that it wasn't a Jew that came back to celebrate our God. It wasn't a Jew. It was a foreigner. It was a Samaritan. And I want you to know today that you are going to find Mary, many, not Mary, many Samaritans, many of the least likely of those are these in your life, on your road to your spiritual Jerusalem. Your Jerusalem road is the, is the road to heaven. It's your journey from now till you get to the pearly gates of heaven. And that is your road to Jerusalem. It's your road to destiny. It's destiny's road of every believer. And I want you to know that on that road, you're going to find many Samaritans. Many people that are caught between life and death. Between opposition, bondage, torture, confusion, and identity crisis. And God is going to ask you to stop. God is going to ask you to listen to them. God's going to ask you to love them. God's going to ask you to provide for them. God may even ask you to pray for them. God may even ask you to heal them. Some of them you may just have to clothe. Some you'll have to feed. Some you'll have to hug. And some you'll have to let go. I love that about Jesus. Because when you have the Holy Spirit, and this is truly Fully God, fully man, that's Jesus. Today, you and I are also representatives of the kingdom of God. We are carriers of Jesus. 2,000 years later, and we are also on our own roads of destiny, our own roads to our spiritual Jerusalem. And on that road, on that path between Samaria and Galilee, from today to tomorrow, what person is God going to put in your path? Will you walk by them? Will you notice their cries? Will you be aware of their humanity and their condition? Or will you see them as people, as men afar off and indifferent to their situation? I really believe that this is such a beautiful, beautiful scripture because God is always aware of your condition. He's always aware of our needs. And not only that, he's willing to stop in the middle of his journey. Stop, he is the creator of all the universe of all things seen and unseen. And he will stop all things in his life, in his schedule, to listen to you, to be available to you, to love you, to hold you, to care for you, to protect you, to deliver you, to heal you. The creator of the universe, the most powerful being to ever exist or will ever exist is your God. He's your father, and he's listening, and he's present with you today in your home. He's present at the gym if that's where you're at. He's present on your walk if that's maybe the place that you find yourself listening to this message today. Abba, Father, the Holy Spirit, your helper, your counselor, he's with you. He hasn't forsaken you. He has never forgotten you, and he's always been with you. He's just been waiting the beauty of the Holy Spirit is they call the Holy Spirit a gentleman. And why is that? Because the Holy Spirit will never force himself on you. God created you not as a robot that had to love him, but as a human being with your own heart and your own mind. And he wants your love because you give it freely to him. He wants you to love him not because he created you, but because he loved you. Today, God is continuing to work on our hearts and he wants to show us the mysteries of his hidden kingdom. But it starts with the condition of heart and hearts. What's the condition of your heart today? 
Is it like the Pharisees that they're looking in all the wrong places to understand the mysteries of a living and eternal God? They had all the laws and they followed all the rules and yet they're absent of love. They understood that there was a pride and a privilege that was given to them because they were the leaders of the community, but they had no heart for the condition of broken humanity. They wanted to lead so they could get the glory and not give God the glory. And so we find that in the scripture, I said that two things we would take notice of. The first one is that you and I today, just like Jesus, we have to slow down. We have to make room for God to use us every single day that we're on our journey between Samaria and Galilee. And the second thing that we take notice of is what happens here is that there were all kinds, what, not all kinds, but there were 10 people, 10 lepers, 10 men, broken humanity, and only one out of 10 came back to glorify God. Can I tell you something? Those aren't really good numbers. It's not a very good ratio. And I want you to know something, that even here, Jesus experiences rejection. I want you to know that in your life, you'll probably experience rejection. And can I tell you something? Don't lose heart. Jesus continued his journey to Jerusalem, even though only one out of 10 praised him for healing their lives. I want you to know today that there's going to be people that come in your life they're going to question the Jesus in you and you're going to do great things for them and yet they're not going to receive your Jesus and because they don't receive him, they're going to reject you. Can I encourage you to continue on your road to Jerusalem? Can I, can, can I encourage you to continue to develop your character in God? Can I, can, can I encourage you to continue to pray, continue to love, continue to believe, continue to spend time with God and, and be that vehicle for God's love on earth? I'm telling you, the numbers weren't good for Jesus and the numbers may not always be the greatest for you. But I want you to know something, somebody that you're going to encounter is gonna be forever changed because of your desperate need of God and obedience to God. So just know that today, that sometimes things don't always go the way you expect, even when your name is Jesus. Let's continue to read. And it says here, 20, now having been questioned by the Pharisees as to when the kingdom of God was coming, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there it is, for behold, the kingdom of God is in your midst. Now we go back to the New King James and it says that the kingdom of God is within you. But before I go deeper in that, I want to share one other thought. The thought has to do with the story of the 10 lepers. Remember, Jesus is teaching the disciples, but he's also teaching the Pharisees. And in this scripture, what we find in the story is that it wasn't the Jew that came back glorifying God. It was a Samaritan. Jesus made a point of letting these Jews that had the pedigree, that felt like they were part of God's promised people, that, that they didn't have room in their hearts for God, that they were not grateful, but the least likely being a non-Jew was the one that was grateful. That was, a, that was a prodding by Jesus at the Pharisees. Jesus was saying is that you may not have room for me, but I'll make room for them. And they may not know me, but guess what? They will recognize me and they will glorify me, though you do not receive me. And that's exactly what happens in the scripture. That's really what happens in Jesus' life. Jesus is the Messiah. He is the anointed one, chosen by God, created by God, man, fully man, fully God. And yet the Pharisees never recognized his authority. They never welcomed him. They never understood him because they had hardened hearts. And so his kingdom remained hidden to them. So let's go back to the scripture. And it says here, and it's in verse, what is it? I believe 20. 
Now, when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation, meaning you cannot be ready for the kingdom by just sitting there. You can't be ready for the kingdom just because you fill your head with a bunch of information. It says, nor will they say, see here or see there, for indeed the kingdom of God is within you. See, you cannot be a spectator in the kingdom of God. You can't. You can't think about a God or watch a God come past you. You have to be engaged with God. Your faith requires action. Your faith requires interaction. God does not want a monologue. God doesn't just want to tell you what to do. He wants to interact with you. He wants to get in your life. He wants to get in your mess. He wants to take your mess and he wants to make it a message. But God wants to be fully involved, fully engaged in your and mine lives. Today, we have to look at what these Pharisees could not understand. And it didn't have to do with their heads. It had to do with their hearts. Isn't it interesting that last week, or actually the last two weeks, as we've been studying, what we've been seeing is the need for us to give our minds and renew our minds. But in this case, it was, it's not a condition of renewing as a prescription was required in past messages. The prescription in this case was the condition of the hearts of the Pharisees. Nothing could make it into their heads because their hearts were wrong towards Jesus. And that's the very true reality of you and I today. That if our hearts aren't right toward Jesus, then we won't serve him. If our hearts aren't grateful towards Jesus, then we won't love him. What we need to do is we have to give God our hearts once again. If we will allow our hearts to be given to God, they'll be softened. And the things that were so elusive to you and I will begin to make sense. God will begin to show you why certain things happened to you, why certain people came into your life, and why certain people had to leave your life. The truth is, is that God continues to show you that he is the lover of your soul. So with that, I want to go ahead and I want to really conclude this message. I don't believe that this message is one of the longest ones, but I do believe it's one of the simplest ones. And it's time for us to understand that as we close, that God doesn't just want our heads, he also wants our hearts. And with that, let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for all of the wisdom that's in your word. I thank you for all the tender love that you've taken in leaving us your word. Your word guides us, it guards us, it challenges us, it stretches us, it heals us, it delivers us. God, I thank you that your word today is healing our hearts, it's softening our hearts, and it's freeing our minds. It's renewing us and it's strengthening us. Lord, I thank you today that you are unlocking the hidden things of your kingdom by unlocking our hearts. Lord, today, each and every person that's listening, God, I ask that you would continue to heal our hearts. Give us fresh revelation. Give us a fresh desire. Give us fresh hope. Lord, I thank you for this time in the body of Christ, in our current season, Lord. I thank you that you birthed us in this time because, Lord, there's much work to be done. As your word says, what? The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. God, I thank you that right now the issue of being a laborer is not an issue of the mind, but an issue of the heart. Lord, today we give our hearts to you to serve you, to love you, to continue to journey with you on our own personal roads to Jerusalem between a place called Samaria and Galilee, a place called temporary and eternity. I thank you, God, that you're showing us that our lives mean so much more when they're placed in your hands. So we honor you, we glorify you. In Jesus' most holy name we pray. Amen.